Jonah, Jonah, amen. He said, well, what has that got to do with this lesson? You'll see in a minute. If you know the book of Jonah, you know what happened to Jonah, you'll know it has everything to do with anger. Amen, Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4. Amen. Boy, I tell you, amazing, amazing book in the Bible, a short one, only four chapters, but wow, so much learning, teaching in this book of Jonah. You know what? Some people say, I'm running, you know, someone says, I'm running from God. You can't run from God if you're saved. He's in you. He's with you every step of the way. Amen. You're just not in fellowship with the Lord. You're fighting God. Like we sung, let him have his way with you. Amen. So in Jonah chapter 4, Jonah chapter 4, let me just read this short chapter, and we'll focus on anger for a minute. We'll kind of recap a little bit about what's, what we've talked about last week. Uh, verse f 1 Chapter 4 of Jonah. But mm, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Mm -hmm. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and great and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. <laughs> it is better for me to die than to live. Wow. Then, notice all of these conjunctions here. Then said the Lord, Though is thou well to be angry? That's the question I want to ask you. The Lord says, You really, is your anger justified? We'll see about it in a few minutes. Amen? So Jonah went out of the city, sat on the east side of the city there, and made him a booth, and sat. Uh, sat under it in the shadow till it, he might see what would become of the city. Verse 6, And the Lord, God, prepared a gourd, and it made to come up over Jonah, and it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So G Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. Verse 7, But God prepared a worm. When the morning rose the next day, and he smote the gourd that it withered, and it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Verse 9, And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? There we go. Questions. God's asking him questions. And he says, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Mm -hmm. Then said the Lord, Thou hast pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? Let's pray. Father, bless your word. Bless our time together this morning, Lord God. I pray, Father, your will would be accomplished as we've sung in one of our congregationals. We need to let you have your way with us, Lord God. Help us to, help us to not just sing that song, but help us to make that a reality in our life today for those present here and online. So, Father, uh, touch hearts, Lord God move in a great way. Fill me, use me, Lord God, to deliver this truth. We just thank you for salvation. Pray for those who might not know you. And God, will just thank you again for the opportunity that we can fellowship here this morning. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We'll say a few words about Jonah. A little bit about Jonah. If you know the account of Jonah, many know about Jonah. Most people know that he was swallowed by a whale. Um, some know beyond that. They know that, why was he running? He was running because he didn't want to obey God. And in the account in the chapter 1, we read about Jonah. He's running from God. He says he's running from the presence of the Lord. Good luck. <laughs> 
omnipresent God. You're going to run from the presence of God. Good luck. It ain't, it ain't possible. Pardon the English. What happens? He gets the fair paid. You know, someone says, if it's not God's will, God won't provide the money. God, provided, God allowed Jonah to have the money to go away from him, even though it wasn't God's will for him to go away from him. And they got on the ship. He went to Tarshish, which if you look on most Bible maps, they'll, they'll show it in Portugal or Spain, on the other end of the Mediterranean. Nineveh is in modern-day Iraq. Mosul. You ever hear of the word Mosul? That's, that's Nineveh. That's where Nineveh is. Talk about God says, go here. You're going way out of the way. I don't want to go there. And if you understand the mindset of a Jew, God gave them the scriptures. God gave the Jew the books of Moses. They felt, many of them, maybe not all, but many of them felt, no, this is us, and they're Gentiles, and they're not of the commonwealth of the nation of Israel. I don't, we, don't, we don't need to tell them anything, but God's a gracious God. He even mentions that in what we just read. He says, I know you, God. Yeah, you know God, but you don't want to follow God's leading. You know what God's like, but you're just having some problems with this God that you say you believe in. And of course, we know a storm comes. They try to throw over the wares. They throw over a lot of the cargo they were carrying. And finally, Jonah says, throw me overboard. He'll solve your problems. They threw him overboard, solved the problem. He got swallowed by a whale. That's where you read chapter 2, and then chapter 3, you read this. And, the, and after he gets it right, the whale gets sick of the backslidden prophet. Chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says, The word of the Lord came unto Jonah a second time. Aren't you glad for that? You know what? You think, it's over with. I messed up. Aren't you glad that after Peter denied the Lord, we're not condoning denying the Lord Jesus Christ, but the Bible gives us Peter's epistles. Aren't you glad for that? That God, listen, listen, God can use you again. I don't know what you've done, but God can use you again. Amen? It's not over with. Listen, you're saved. You know Christ. You're alive this morning. God's not finished with you. God's got something for you to finish here. Your, your, your race has not been completed yet. The course is not over with. Don't forget that. Amen? Amen? You think, I messed up. Who hasn't? Amen. Just ask God. God, guide me and direct me. So he goes, but he goes with a wrong spirit, and he preaches the message that God told him to preach. In the duration, he told him to preach it. And what happened? A great revival broke out, and he got mad. He got mad that God would do that to those people and save them. Isn't that something? Talk about prejudice. We think, oh, those people don't deserve the gospel. Who are you talking to? Listen, God told him to go there to preach because he wants, he wants to reach out to people. The Bible tells us in Peter's epistle, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's a great God that we serve. He's an amazing God. There's people that you and I would look at and say, they don't really deserve that. Did you? Did you deserve salvation? Where did we get that idea from? It's by the grace and mercy of God that you're going to heaven and not to hell. Amen? So finally, he's, all, he's upset. That's chapter 4 where we started. He's upset. He's mad. He's upset. He's angry. Very angry, the Bible says. Because God did something that he thought God shouldn't have done. How about you this morning? You get a little bit upset at God? Because he did something that you didn't understand or didn't agree with? That's the way some Christians are. That's the way a lot of lost people. There's some things lost people blame God for that God did not do. I'm telling you. Come on in. Amen. Praise the Lord. And you know what? So here's Jonah. Here's Jonah. And Jonah chapter 4. So the Bible tells us here he's very angry. Verse 1, and as we go down, he says, take my life from thee, in verse 3, for it is better for me to die 
than to live. He said, I'd rather die than live. Isn't that something? Because he's so mad at God. He didn't think those people deserved being saved. Hmm. And then I like the question, and I'll read it twice, and we'll get right into a little review and get into the message for this morning. Verse 4 of Jonah 4, Then the Lord said, Doest thou well to be angry? So let me ask you that question. God asked Jonah that question. Are you saying I'm running from God? I'm not saying that, but if the shoe fits, wear it. If it fits, put it on. Are you running from God? You may not be. He says, do you do well to be angry? What are you mad at? What are you upset over? What are you worked up about? Why did you blow your stack? Why, well, how did that, why did that happen? Amen? And he asked them again because what happens is it was hot like it is in here. I don't know what the temperature is, but it's hotter up here because I'm closer to the ceiling. And you're supposed to, you know, should be a little cooler down there. You got a little bit of a cross breeze and all that kind of stuff. We got the fans going. But he says, you know, it's pretty hot here, Lord. So he caused this gourd to, to grow up. And it brought some shade. And he was glad. He says, whoa, this is so wonderful. I'm, oh, I feel so much better. And the Lord says he prepared the gourd, verse 6. He prepared a worm, verse 7. There's a lot of prepareds in the book of Jonah. He prepared a worm. You know, sometimes God will allow a worm to come along to ruin your gourd. <laughs> we don't like that one. We're fine. I bought the bottle of stuff and I'm spraying, stop eating our plants, spraying all this stuff here and there. <laughs> you upset? You upset? A little upset to God? Amen? So he prepared a, a worm and it smote the gourd. It withered, verse 8. And it came to pass when it, the sun did arise, God prepared a vehement east wind. And now God prepares a storm. <laughs> Amen. You got, you got worms. Amen. Then you got the, the storm. Amen. And now he said, man, I want to die, Lord. And then the Lord says in verse 9, God said to Jonah, doest thou well to be angry for the Lord? Just in case he didn't get it the first time, he asked him twice. You have a right to get angry. And we must discern without, I, I'm not going through the whole ang anger uh, series that I did in 2018. At least not right now. I'm not planning that. But there is a thing called righteous indignation. And we've talked about in our Life of Christ study, and a lot of us, many of us, would really be challenged to not sin in anger. Because a lot of it's personal. As opposed to righteous indignation. So we're not, so setting aside righteous indignation, the Bible tells us in Paul's letter to the book, uh, the Ephesian believers, he says, be angry and sin not. Does he not say that? So we got to discern. There's no contradictions in the Bible. God's not contradicting himself. You just got to study the scriptures. There is a time for righteous indignation. But again, that's a whole separate study. So if you were with us last week, we're talking about stress, dealing with stress. And again, I must remind you again, I am not a doctor. I don't claim to be a doctor. I am not giving you medical advice. If you are not well, you need to go see a doctor. Amen? I read an article on National Post this, this week, and it was a critical, very critical article against Christianity. But some of it was because the way Christians talk, you'd think it's, I don't know who read this article. I read it. I saved that article. And at the end, he says, wasn't Luke a doctor? This is an atheist man who wrote that article in National Post. He said a bunch of other things. I'm not going to reiterate everything. Amen? So, I'm not a doctor. Go see a doctor if you're not well. But we must remember 1 Thessalonians 5.23, you are made of spirit, soul, and body. Three parts. So for every problem that you deal with, there's a, there's a spirit component a soul component, and a body component. We must understand that, that, that dynamic there. The other thing is this. We don't want to deal with symptoms, just symptoms alone. You may have symptoms that you're dealing with, but would you not want to get to the root of your problem? If you're going to the doctor, you just don't want them to relieve the pain. You want to know, why am I experiencing this pain? Correct? 
That's what you want. So it's important for you, just like spiritually for us, that we would get to the root of the problem. So sometimes, sometimes the root of the problem is something you might have never thought about. Amen? Especially on the spiritual realm. And sometimes sin, spiritual problems, manifest themselves in the body. That's, a whole, that's our study, stress. They do manifest themselves depending on what we're talking about. So, so we talked all about that last week. And we talked about the five factors. You need to do a, like a spiritual or a checkup, a total health checkup. What you think affects you, what you say, what you do, and what you eat, and what you inherit. And what you inherit, you can't change. Your DNA, whatever. You know, sometimes people had cardiovascular problems. Their parents, grandparents, that could be transferred down. And generational, it can be. That is outside of your... I mean, you can't, other than get help, go to a doctor, get diagnosed, and make sure you take care of yourself. But there's some other things that you can control. What you do, what you eat, amen? What you say, what you think, you can control that. And if you don't do that part, you're, you're, you're going to be a mess. You're really going to be a mess, uh, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And we need to, we need to guard ourselves. And uh, so, and God is for medicine. Proverbs 17, 22, the readers died just for years. Always use this phrase here. Uh, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. In other words, medicine does good. <laughs> Let's reverse the words, amen? So the Bible says there is a place for medicine. I don't believe in medicine. Then you don't believe what God said. Amen? So, so now we're going to look at some root causes of stress in your life. If you're not saved, you need to be saved. You need to come to know Christ the Savior. He died on the cross for you. All you must do is realize you're a sinner. You're lost, deserving of hell. Christ paid for your sins on the cross so that you can be forgiven and be with him in heaven forever. It has nothing to do with of being baptized in a church or being a member of a church or living a good life, but it has to do with one thing, trust and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. After you're saved, you ought to live right. That should be the outworking of the working of God inward, the Holy Spirit working inside of you that you ought to live right and serve God. Amen? But for, you can't clean your life up good enough for God to accept you. He accepted Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago on Calvary's cross. Perfect man, sinless, never sinned one time. You got to look to him or you are not going to heaven. You say, that's pretty exclusive. That's not very diverse. That's not very inclusive, pastor. That's what the Bible teaches. Jesus said, I am the way, a definite article. There's no, there's no two ways, three ways, four ways to heaven. One way. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man come of the Father but by me. So that God's pretty direct, amen? That's why some people don't like the Bible. So this morning, when we're looking at this, and, and again, I have a whole bunch of medical stuff here, and I, I've just copied it, and, and again, I got... The information I'm, I've looked at is, was given by uh, a doctor, Dr. George Crabb. If you go to RU Recovery, no spaces, um, I try, can't remember, just uh, Reformers Unanimous, you'll come to a website, and there is a page there where you can find Dr. Crabb's books. He is a doctor, medical doctor, practicing doctor in the United States, and he's also a Christian, and also he preaches the Bible. He goes and preaches. Can you imagine that? Last I heard him preach, he said he even has a track rack in his office. How about that? He offers spiritual help. Wouldn't that be great if you had a doctor that was a Christian? Amen. And that would give you, here, here's a gospel track. Amen. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what a blessing. Amen. So much of what I've received is from him. He's written some amazing books. He gives you the medical side of things. He gives you the spiritual side of things. Amen. It gives you the complete picture, spirit, soul, and body. That's why I like his books. We've done the one on depression. I've done the one on anger. And this is the one on stress that I preached years ago, eight years ago. 
And we're just doing it because I feel some people are stressed out because of what we've experienced for the last year and a half. Amen? So it's still, it's still good teaching, good preaching. Amen? So he goes through a whole bunch of stuff about the increase of cortisol, cortisol concerning stress. Um, it's produced in your bodies and so forth. And it, it's helpful at times, but elevated levels of cortisol uh, for long periods of time can have a negative impact on the body. The liver increases, releases more glucose, and it decreases the DHEA, which causes fatigue. The thyroid slows down, resulting in decreased neurotransmitters, which will slow you down, make you ache, make you feel fatigued. Then there is a decrease in cell energy, causing fatigue. Symptom, tired all the time, no motivation. And he's talking about, he's dealing with stress. The whole book that he talks about this is stress. So the first thing he addresses is the seven root causes of stress in the lives of believers. Number one, anger. And how does it affect you? How could anger? Listen, you could have a pre-existing condition. You can have the inherited condition, as I've already mentioned, where you've inherited uh, some heart trouble, uh, cardiovascular problems from your parents or previous generations. But anger can also affect your cardiovascular. It affects your cardiovascular system, the heart and the blood vessels. As I've already said, in many cases, spiritual problems can manifest themselves in your body. Some people don't realize that. Spiritual problems can manifest themselves in your body. Not all physical problems are a result of personal spiritual problems, like the inherited ones, amen? Amen. So just because you are sick doesn't mean there's something you're not right with God. Not necessarily. Amen? People got COVID that were as right with God that you could ever come. I know a pastor in D.C. who got it, never been hardly sick a day in his life, and ended up on a, uh, a, vent a ventilator. Is he perfect? No, I'm just saying. He, he lives righteous. He lives godly. He's a good man. People get sick. We live in a fractured, cursed world because of the fall of man 6,000 years ago in the garden. But anger can have a, an effect on you. So an important thing is this. You, listen, you need to resolve physical problems through, yes, as I've already mentioned, medical advice and medicine. But we also need to investigate, is there also a, another contributing factor spiritually to this? that we can reduce it, maybe not eliminate it, but maybe even reduce it. By the way, I believe God can heal. Do you believe that? God can heal. God can do anything. Amen? Aren't you glad for that? God's not dead. He's alive. He'll heal people. Amen? But according to his will, not my will. I'll pray. Say, Lord, your will be done, please. It's like Jesus in the garden. Amen? So, anger. It affects the cardiovascular, the heart, the blood vessels. We've quoted Jonah 4.4, doest thou well to be angry? Amen? Having a short fuse? Amen? Sometimes that's a, that's a symptom of a spiritual problem. Why are you so touchy? What? Bang, all of a sudden you blow up. <laughs> I woke up some of you, yeah. <laughs> Anger, anger, anger. Look at 1 Samuel 25. We'll look at a couple of examples, and we'll try to keep an eye on the time and cover what we can in here. I also have a handout at the front here, and I'll give it, uh, I'll put it on the back there. You can help yourself. It's um, how to have victory over anger, okay? I didn't write this up. I didn't make this up. You know what? Why reinvent the wheel? Good, solid, spiritual advice. Amen. Praise the Lord. And uh, so in 1 Samuel chapter 25, some of you know the story about David and Nabal. Amen? 1 Samuel 25. We won't go in every detail, of course. We can't. But, but what we have here in this chapter is um, a guy named Nabal. And he, he, he blows a fuse. He blows a fuse here. He does. So the Bible tells us, watch this now. Verse 2 of chapter 25, And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel, and the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing the sheep in Carmel. Now the name of that man was Nabal, and the name of his wife was Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding. And we'll see her in the later part of this chapter giving some sound counsel to David. Amen? Hey, guys, don't, don't ever forget that your wife could have some, maybe some more understanding than you. 
I know some guys don't like that. <laughs> Amen. There was a time where God told Abraham <laughs> to hearken unto his wife. We studied that in our Genesis study. Yeah, amen. I don't know about that. Yeah, you, 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 know, you want to believe the Bible or not, amen? We don't cherry pick verses out of here and pick the ones we like and discard the rest. And the Bible says she's of good understanding, a beautiful countenance, but the man was churlish and evil in his doings and was of the house of Caleb. He was a miserable man. Miserable. He had some problems. So anyway, David, he was in the wilderness. You read verse 4, um, that Nabal sheared the sheep. Verse 5, David sent 10 young men. David said unto the young men, Gird, get you up to Carmel, go to Nabal, greet him in my name. Thus shall he say to him, that liveth and prosper, peace be both to thee, peace be to thy, thine house, peace be unto all that thou hast. And I've, now I've heard, verse 7, that thou hast shears, now thy shepherds, which are with us, we hurt them not, neither was there aught any missing unto them, and all the while they were in Carmel. Ask thy young men, and they will show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes, for we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants and to thy son David. When David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all the words in the name of David and cease. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, who is David, and who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Now watch this. Shall I, notice, this is a, this is a mark of an immature, selfish person who's preoccupied with himself. I circled every one of these pronouns. I, shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears and give it unto thee whom I know not whence they be? Oh, oh, oh. It was pretty hard. Mm. So the men turned around, went back, told David, oh, oh, oh. Skip down to verse 14. David got upset. David got upset. And one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our masters. And he railed on them. He rail on people. Hey, Amen. How are you dealing with people? You're, if you're saved, you're a Christian. How are you dealing with people? How are we dealing with people? In the way that Christ would want us to deal with people? And, but she said here, but the men were very good unto us, and we, or the, the, the servant. And he says, um, neither missed we anything as long as we, have, uh, we were conversing with them and when we were in the fields, and there were a wall unto us both night and day. In other words, they were so helpful. Verse 17, now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his household, for he is the son of Belial. You know what that is? The devil. He doesn't know God. He's upset. He's mad. He's upset that the men cannot speak to him. And Abigail made haste, took 200 loaves, two bottles of wine, five sheep ready dressed, five measures of parched corn, and 100 clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs, and laid them on the, on the ass. It sounds like what, what Jacob did to Esau in our Sunday school lesson. Amen? A gift pacifieth anger. Isn't that right? David's a little bit upset here over how his servants were treated. Amen? Didn't get any kind of respect or anything. Anyway, so, so anyway, finally, look at verse 19. And she said unto her servants, go on before. Behold, I come after you. But she told not uh, her husband Nabal. And it was so as she rode on the ass, she came down by the covert of the hill. Behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. Now David had said, surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertaineth unto him, and he hath re requited me evil for good. You know, the Bible says we're supposed to respond uh, against evil with good. He says, I've done nothing but good, and I get evil. Does that sound like the world sometimes? So anyway... So more and do also do, verse 22, God unto the enemies of David, if I leave of all that pertain to him by the morning light, than any that pisseth against the wall. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted, lighted off the ass, and fell before David on her face. 
bowed her face herself to the ground and fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me let this iniquity be, and let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. You know what happens here? The Bible tells us she's interceding. David, please don't do it. Please don't do it. She even regards, she says in verse 25, let not the, my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, as for his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name. Folly is with him. But I am thine handmaid. Saw not the young men of my Lord when thou didst sin. So the Bible, again, just goes through this whole thing here. And what happens is what God does and through this whole thing uses this woman to curb David's anger over what took place. And you know what happened here? Look at verses 30. We've got to skip down here. Verses 36 to 38. So when Abigail came to Nabal, behold, he held a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And again, David listened to her. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. And Nabal's heart was merry within, for he was very drunken. Wherefore, she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light, but it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal and his wife had told him these things that his heart died within him. He became as a stone and it came to pass about 10 days after the Lord smote Nabal and he died. Basically what happened was he had a heart attack or a stroke. You know what? You losing your cool and having these bursts of anger are going to contribute to cardiovascular problems. We see another example in the Bible concerning Asa, King Asa, King of Judah, in 2 Chron Chronicles chapter 15, 16, and 17. And the Bible even says there that he had a problem. He had, this, he had an anger problem. The prophet came to him. He got mad. It was full of rage. You can read that in 2 Chronicles 15, 16, 17. And the Bible tells us that he had a disease in his feet. And... What happened was, I mean, I, I don't know if anybody's ever dealt with this. You've got family, friends, congestive heart failure, CHF. That's what they call it, abbreviation. It shows up in blisters in your feet. We find out Asa died. He had an anger problem. He got mad at the prophet of God, didn't like what he said. So will anger, how can I say it? So there's, there's, there's some root causes. There's symptoms. You've got, okay, you got an anger problem. How are you dealing with it? You're going to have a handout that I'll go give you when you go home. But let me give you some other things. Number one, okay? Number one, you've got to repent of your anger. You've got to repent of it. You've got to repent of it. The Bible says, listen now, if you've offended people because you are an angry person, you need to go to those people and deal with them. In Matthew 18, verses 15, 16, and 17, it talks about if you've got a problem with somebody, you don't tell anybody else, just you and that other person you've got a problem with, you go see them privately, one-on-one. -on -one. And if you can't deal with it there, then you engage a couple of other people, two or three witnesses. The last thing you want to do is get the whole church involved. You, deal. you know, I've found in all the years of ministry since I've been in Nova Scotia these last 27 years, I've been able to deal with most of the problems privately, one-on-one. -on -one. That's how we solve most of our problems. They took care of themselves. Number two, are you ready? So number one, repent of it. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 13, to confess and forsake your sin. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Confess and forsake. A lot of people confess, but they don't forsake it. They don't forsake it. So number one, you repent of your anger. What does God say? Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. These are hard things. Love enemies. Bless people who curse you. Do good to who? People who hate you. Pray for them. Pray for them, which despitefully use you and persecute you. You know, I, it really upsets me. I have my political views, but I try to keep them out of this pulpit. Because you come, you, you need to be fed the Word of God. But we have our agreements and disagreements with political leaders. But let me ask you one thing. Paul's letter to Timothy says we need to pray for them. Are you praying for them? Are you praying for them? 
And he says, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Amen? That's what the Lord says. That's what the Lord says. So, the Bible says here, not only should we uh, repent of it, and the Bible says here that we're supposed to love people, to bless them that curse us, and pray for them with despitefully use you and um, persecute us. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. I want to so see you see something else here. Ephesians chapter 4. Galatians, Ephesians. You know, if, if you spend time in the Bible and you're in a good Bible-believing church, and I do not claim to be the only Bible-believing church in, in HRM. I don't, I'm not claiming that we're the only ones preaching the Word of God. But I believe I have tried, if, as pastor here, to, to preach the Word. Preach it straight. Um, preach it with love and compassion. With the, with, the, with the main goal to help you, not to hurt you. Amen? So, some people don't understand, but what I preach on Sunday morning will not always be what I preach on Sunday night. I don't preach this message four times a week. You know, we've kind of scaled back a little bit online on Sunday nights, and we're doing just in person only. As a matter of fact, I got some people that said they would come tonight, some more immigrants, some more new people to Canada. Praise God. What a blessing. And they'll be here tonight. Can I say this? You know what? Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, it's all to help you grow in the Lord. It's all to help you to grow in grace. Listen, you know, if, if you are providentially hindered, you can't be here, of course watch it online. But I apologize, you won't be able to watch Sunday nights anymore. I just need a break from this camera and all this electronics here. Amen? Um, I don't think we're going back to where we were prior to COVID. I really don't. You know? Um, I just know this. My hope's in the Lord. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the future in Christ. In the world, I know things are not necessarily going to get better. They're not. Jesus even talked about that. But Ephesians 4, he gives a list in verse 11, he gives a list of people that God uses in your life. And in, in verse 11, he says, he gave some apostles, some prophets, watch this, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So someone may say, you know what, I don't need to be part of a church. Well, who's your pastor? Where are you getting your help from? You, you know, you, you want to get help with stress? Oh, I can, you can read a book, and yes, you can get some of that. But you know what God's will for you is? To come in, to be a part of a church, and to be able to talk to people and see people. Iron sharpens iron. You meet people. That people can reach out to help you. Amen? They can help you. The Bible says there in verse Y, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. You know what that means? He gave you a pastor to help you grow in the Lord. You say, I can grow on my own too. Yes, you can, but you also need a pastor. Some people don't realize that. They think, no, we don't, I don't need a church. You know, I don't need to be part of a church. You're wrong on that. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure and the stature of fullness of Christ. So the Bible says this. These messages, these lessons that, that I'm delivering to you are there to help you grow. And you know what God promised I preached a whole series of messages last year on the victory that God gave us in Jesus Christ. And that includes anger. That includes anger. Unless you spend time to, to read the Word of God, be under preaching and teaching of the Word of God, you're probably not going to get that victory that you need over this issue called anger. You need to spend time. You need to be with God's people. And the Bible says that... He says, God's goal for you is to be that perfect man 
unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So what's important this morning is this. It's not about me. It's not about that we're supposed to be more spiritual than someone else. He says the standard is Jesus Christ. The measure is Jesus Christ, not me. Where are you? Not me. No, don't look at me. Don't look at somebody else here or someone outside these four walls that you're thinking about right now. Oh, I know so-and-so is really spiritual. How are you in relation to Christ? H have you gotten a grip on this matter of anger? Have you sorted that out in your life? And the Bible says what? Watch this. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. He said this, you don't spend time in the word. You're not under the preaching and teaching of God's word. You'll be easily tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Something comes along. I got people constantly. You know, YouTube is a great thing. We use it for the church. But if you don't, you're not discerning, you'll, get, you'll go astray. You'll go astray. I guarantee you, you'll go astray. If you don't know the truth, this truth will make you free. <laughs> He'll free you up from the bondage of sin and corruption that this world is in. Amen? It'll help you have the victory that you need in your life and whatever it is you're struggling with so that you can reduce the stress that you're dealing with. Listen, we all face some kind of stress. If you were with us last week, you know, the word distress appears in our Bible. We even looked at it. And basically, God says that, you know what? We, stress has been around for a long time, for thousands of years. We think, oh, we're so stressful today in 2021. Read your Bible. Okay, there's different areas of stress. Some of it we, we don't help ourselves with. We spend all this time on this device. We read stuff we probably shouldn't read. I stay abreast of the news and so forth, but you better be choosy what you fill your heart and your mind with, or this will cause you stress. Because you know what we have today that we've never had in the history of mankind? You got the knowledge of the whole world on this device. If you have access to the internet, you have data, you can Google whatever it is, whatever Apple uses, and you can find that information of what man knows. And you're getting disaster after disaster, negative news constantly coming at you through this. That will cause stress. That will cause depression. And sometimes, okay, like today, here I am, I'm preaching, I'm teaching. If I spent a, a lot of time watching and reading all of this stuff constantly, I get angry inside. I'll just, I'll, I'm going to admit this to you. I get angry inside. And if I get angry inside and I come to this pulpit, I might not deliver the truth of the word of God in the way that God would have me to deliver it. Because I've built up this anger inside of me because of all the things that are going on in the world. Amen? I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that at all. So what does God want us to do here? God wants us to have that victory. Let's look at some of those places, and we got to wrap up here for this morning. Some of them, you've already, you, you've already seen these, okay? You can have the victory in this area of anger, okay? Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8. Let's just go over these. We're not going to spend a lot of time. I'm just, we're going to read the verses, and that's it, because you need to see this. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress? Did you see that? Distress? Did you see that? We're talking about stress this morning. Die stress, distress, is double. D-I meaning double. Two, twice. How about that? Distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written for thy sake, we are all killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God says you're more than a conqueror if you're saved. You say, I, I'm overcome. That wasn't God's will. 
because you've yielded, you've submitted to some things that God does not want you to yield to, and when you do that, you give away that victory. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. We're more than conquerors this morning. Amen? And he mentioned, can stress? Listen, you know, listen, if you go through stress, it doesn't separate you from the love of Christ. He said, man, it's real tough, you know? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. I love this passage. You're right at the end when Paul's talking about the, the return of Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. I can't wait for his return. Amen? The Bible tells us here. Um, it's the resurrection chapter. Verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So the Bible tells us he gave us the victory. You got the victory. Amen? If you want to keep that victory, don't yield to the world, the flesh, and the devil. Amen? He's given us that. That's present tense. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Now... I like that. I've circled that word. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. So the Lord says, I, I like this because look at these words. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph. Are you in the triumph ground or defeat ground? <laughs> Amen. God says, he would cause, God's cause, God's purpose for your life is to be in triumph, amen? Always. That's what God wants for us. You can have that if you want it. Do you want it? We seem to like, we get certain things that we want, but what about some spiritual matters? Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. Let me start in verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. That's going on today. After the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. How about that? The Bible says we're complete the moment you come to know Christ. You have what you need which is the next passage, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. 2 Peter 1, 3. You need to tuck these verses away, write these down. You need to refer to them because whatever it is you're dealing with in the upcoming weeks that we're going to go over, you know, these different things that we're going to look at, these, we're going to look at anger, we're going to look at guilt, we're going to look at lust and bitterness and greed and fear and envy. These are the seven things we're going to look at in upcoming weeks. I, whatever it is, it may not even be in this list. What are you dealing with? What I've given you in these passages are the things that you need to look to and trust God with and say, God, this is not your will. I know that for a fact, amen? It's not your will. And if we are in a place where we're not in the will of God, we need to do something about it. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. We, we spent weeks in our, in our Sunday morning messages on this whole thing about the principles of spiritual growth. Verse 3, according as divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. God says he's given us everything that you need that pertains to life and godliness. Everything, the moment you get saved. And last of all, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. We're going to wrap up here. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. We're on victory ground. We're on victory ground, not on defeated ground. You have the victory. When you sin, you yield to, to the world, the flesh, and the devil. You give away that victory. When it comes to anger, you know what? We could talk about, you know, ruling your spirit like the Old Testament talks about in the book of Proverbs, but really what it is is it's Holy Spirit control. Amen. That's what it is. The Bible says be filled with the Spirit. 
Amen. That's what it says. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. In Ephesians 5, 18. That's what we need. Now watch this. First John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God. Are you saved this morning? If you are, he's talking about you. Overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. What's going to build up your faith is going to help you to overcome things. The more I feed the Spirit, you read Romans 6, read Romans 7. The more I feed the flesh, the more I'm going to go towards the things of the flesh and the world. The more I feed of the Spirit, the closer I'm going to get to God. What are you feeding on? What are you looking at? What are you listening to? Is it taking you, drawing you away from God, or is it bringing you closer to God? Amen. That's what we got to look at. And if you want to have help with any of these things, whether it be the anger, the guilt, lust, bitterness, greed, fear, envy, any one of those things, you got to turn to the Lord. And if you don't, some of these issues, if you don't get them right, especially this anger one, will contribute if you have heart trouble already. You might have heart trouble. It could cause some heart problem, cardiovascular problems, but it may contribute to that if you don't get, get a hold of it. Amen? So many... Again, many problems manifest themselves in the body. But the reality is this. You've got to understand something. There is no pill that will take care of a spiritual problem. That's what you've got to remember. So if there's a spiritual component you're ignoring that you need to work on, why don't you eliminate that one and get it right? Why don't you eliminate that one get it right with God? Because there's no pill any doctor can give you that will cure the spiritual problems in your life. That's the Lord. That's Jesus Christ. That's the Holy Spirit of God. That's the Word of God. Amen? Amen. you gotta, you got to understand it. Anyway, let's, uh, let's all stand and we'll close here in prayer. Father, I pray today, Lord God, you would work in each and every heart and life. Lord God, you know those who know you, who have that relationship with you. I pray, Father that you would help them. Whatever struggles they're facing in their life, help them to have the victory. Help them to see, Lord God, that you, you, they were on victory ground, but they just kind of gave it up. Lord God, help them today. Help those who may struggle with this matter of anger. Lord God, help us to see that with you, with your help and strength, we can overcome. We can deal with this. We pray for those who are lost today. We pray, God, that you would help them to, Lord God, come to know you, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Oh, Lord God, help them to connect with us here in person and online, Lord God. Help them realize that you're the answer, Lord God, for this world today. Oh, God, we just pray folks would open their eyes, open their hearts to you and what Christ did on the cross. Now, Father, as we prepare to go home here, Lord God, that you would just, again, give us all safety. Help us to meditate and think upon what we've heard this morning in the Sunday school hour and at this church hour, Lord God. Bless this week. May we, Lord God, not leave this building the same as what we were when we came in. Help us to be a changed people and live that changed life before the loss of this world. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.